Tonight's subject is live in the end. I dare say that everyone here would say yes to the statement of scripture. With God, all things are possible. I don't think you'd be here if you did not believe in God. And the God to whom all things are possible. But maybe we stop right there and we separate man from God. And my purpose is to show you that we are not two, that we are one. That God actually became man, that man may become God. So let us now tonight give you my reasons for my claims. We turn to the book of John, the Gospel of John. And we are told that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, that's a mistranslation. The word translated among is the Greek preposition in, within. The Word became flesh and dwelt within us, in us. John used the plural us for the nature whereof we consist, that the Word of God, which is defined in Scripture as the creative power of God and the wisdom of God, did not take upon itself some one person among men. For then that one assumed would have advanced and no more. But Christ to save all did not make this man or that man his habitation, but dwelt in us. That same creative word that created the universe and sustains it dwells in us. Therefore with God all things are possible, and therefore with man all things are possible. So he states it in one book, Matthew, with God all things are possible. But in Mark he states it, all things are possible to him, meaning man, who believes. Can man believe? So this creative word is in us. Well, what is this creative word? It's your own wonderful human imagination. That's Christ in man. Man is all imagination. And God is man. And exists in us and we in him. The eternal body of man is the imagination. And that is Christ himself. The divine body, Jesus. We are his members. So when you say, I am, that's he. Now, can you believe that you are now the man that you would like to be? Though at the moment of your assumption, reason denies it. And your senses deny it. Only just started. But you're right. Can you really conceive a scene? A scene which, if true, would imply the fulfillment of your dream. Yes, imagine it. Certainly you can imagine it. But the problem is, would you believe it? Would you believe in the reality of the thing imagined? If I could, this very moment, imagine myself into a state, any state at all, and dwell in it. Well, now, what is dwelling in it? Well, I am dwelling in it. Well, that's Christ. And that is the resurrecting power of the universe. So if I remain in a state, I will resurrect it and objectify it in my world. But I have to select it and enter the state. If the spectator could enter into any of these states in his imagination, approaching the state on the fiery chariot of his contemplative thought, what would it be like if it were true? How would I feel if I were now the man that I would like to be? How would I know that I could become it? Well, I first, as I assume that I am it, let me think of my friends. Those who really would rejoice with me were it true. Let me imagine that I am seeing them in my mind's eye. How do they see me? If what I am assuming is true, they should see me as I am seeing myself. And if they are friends, they should rejoice with me. So let me now assume that I am seeing, reflected on the face of a friend, that which, if I saw it, would imply he sees in me that which I have assumed that I am. Will that work? Try it. 
I tell you from my own personal experience it works. As we are told in Corinthians, do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail to meet the test. Now we are challenged. He said, come test yourself and see. Well, this is how I test myself. If Christ is in me, and all things are possible to Christ, then I must find out who he is. Well, I have found him as my own wonderful human imagination. And because he dwells not only in me, he dwells in us, everything is possible to everyone in the world. And so you help man best by telling him who Christ is. You could give him all the things of the world that he needs. He'll come back for more tomorrow, unless he knows who Christ is. You can give the entire world to any one of them. They'll spend it, waste it, if they don't know who they are. But tell him who he is, and he doesn't need anything more than the knowledge of who he is and the application of that knowledge. For we are the opting power. It doesn't work itself. I can tell you that your imagination is Christ. And maybe you'll believe me. But unless you actually take it to the point of working upon it and operating it, it means nothing. Well, if this night I really believe it, I would not allow the sun to go down in my sleep unless I feel myself right into the situation of the wish fulfilled. It need not a wish for myself. It could be a wish for a friend, for everyone in my world, because Christ dwells in all and Christ is the true identity of every man. Then everyone must be myself pushed out. It can't be another if God is one. Therefore, I tell myself, as the seeming of her, what I would do were I you. And instead of giving him the thing that he needs physically, tell him how to get it for himself. What would you feel like if now you were the man that you want to be? How would you see the world if things were as you desire them to be? Now, this is what I mean by living in the end. Robert Frost, just the year before he departed this fair, he wrote this story for Life magazine. And he said, the founding fathers did not believe in the future. What a shock that they did not believe in the future. They believed it in. He said, we are always imagining ahead of our evidence. And the most creative thing in man is to believe a thing in. They had no evidence to support their claim to democracy. They were under a king when they threw the king away and began to simply build a concept of the future. They did not believe that the mere passage of time would bring them that dream. They believed it in. And these men believed implicitly in the word of God. And they believed that if I know what I want, when I pray, believe that I have received it, and I will. Well, if that precept is true, literally true, to be accepted literally and fulfilled literally, well, then what am I doing not believing? I should actually know exactly what I would like to be, and discovering what I would like to be as against what I seem to be, dare to assume that I am it. And my assumption, though false, if persisted in, will harden into fact. That I know from my own experience. And I know it's a law. Therefore, if someone is not becoming the man that they would like to be, and they tell me, but I once imagined it and it didn't work, then what are you doing now and still not imagining it? If imagining creates reality, what are you imagining? For if Christ is the only creative power in the universe, and I identify him with my own imagination, well, then my imagination is creating reality. So what am I imagining? Pick up the morning's paper, and I'm fed with everything I should not feast upon. All the horrors of the world, all the negative states of the world. After having read it for an hour, then I must either regurgitate, or in some strange way rub it out, because I can't go along through life feeding upon such nonsense. But if I really know what I want, what you want, what we want, and persuade myself that we have it. If my premise is sound, that imagining creates reality, I should, in the not distant future, hear you tell me that it's worked for you, and the other one tells me, and I in turn tell you, and go through life sharing this marvelous news with others. So I say, live as though it were true. Just as though it were true. That passage of Shakespeare, we have been taught from the primal state, that, that that he which is was wished until he were. Here we find it in Caesar. 
He which is was wished until he were. He wasn't born Caesar, the king. But here was an ambition fulfilled because he was wished into it. He desired it, lived in the state, and everything reshuffled itself to conform to that state to which he was faithful. I see it in my immediate circle. Those who you would not think for one moment would ever become prominent, but they desired to be prominent. Those who desired to be successful, as they conceive success, no two see success in the same manner. Some see it through the eyes of wealth, others through rising in some profession, others in some other manner. But whatever they conceive it to be, they can realize it. If night after night they sleep in the assumption that they are now what they would like to be. And so we go back that if the word is truly the word that creates the system of, in which we live, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. By him all things were made, and without him was not anything made that was made. No, not even the so-called unlovely things. For if all things were made, he has to be responsible for the unlovely things as well. So we are told in scripture, I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. I create the blessing, I create the curses. But now I must choose life. Choose the lovely things, but don't say there's another creator. For if there's another creator, then we are in conflict. So my own imagination can conjure unlovely things if I dwell upon them, or the lovely things. But they can't be two gods. They can't be two creators. And if I can find that creator and identify him with my own wonderful human imagination, then I can't pass the buck. I can't turn to anything and blame it for the things happening in my life. But I know that many of us are not discriminating, and when we see our own harvest, we don't recognize it. We can conceive that we, in some strange manner, permitted these things to be entertained by us. But we did. It could not have come to pass in any other way. So if I believe it and I accept it, well then I will live by it. And then when I know what I want for anyone, and this goes for everything in this world, whether now, this very moment, you desire happiness in marriage. You say, but there's no, not one person in my world that's eligible. I know no one. You don't have to know anyone. All you have to do is to decide within yourself what you want. Now, what would you do if it were true? Would you wear a ring on the one finger which would imply that someone placed it there, one that you admire? Well, then, wear it well. Don't wear a physical ring. Put it on just as though he had placed it there. And sleep feeling that which you are feeling as real. Don't say it's all imagination. Certainly it is, because all imagination is Christ. Therefore, it's all reality. So when you say, well, that's only my imagination. Well, you're just saying, well, that's only a thing called Christ. When you treat imagination that way. Is there anything in this world that wasn't first imagined? Name one thing or point out one thing in this world for me that is now considered to be real, that wasn't first only imagined. What is now proved was once only imagined. Therefore, this is a true statement. All things were made by him. And he is your own wonderful human imagination. All objective reality is solely produced through imagining. The clothes you wear, the chairs in which you are seated, this in which we are now placed, everything was once only imagined. Now tonight, find out exactly what you, not what they think you ought to want, what you want. Ask no one's permission. You don't need any man's permission. You know, need your own decision. What do I want? Now, what would it be like if it were true? What would I feel like were it true? Now, catch the mood and try to give that mood all the sensory vividness of reality, all the tones of reality, and then sleep in it, just as though it were true. And then await the inevitable. The inevitable is you're going to resurrect it and objectify it on the screen of space. And then the world will call it real. And they may not believe you. It doesn't really matter. If you tell them it came to pass because you simply imagined it. Now, they'll point to the series of events that led up to it. And they will give credit to the 
bridge of incident across which you walk towards the fulfillment of that state. And they'll point out some physical thing that was the cause. Now, the cause is invisible, or the cause is God. And God is invisible to mortal eye. Who knows what you're imagining? No one knows. But you can sit down and imagine, and no one can stop you from doing it. But can you give reality to the imagined state? If you do, yes, a bridge of incident will appear in your world. And you'll walk across some series of events leading up to the fulfillment of the imaginal state. But don't give causation to any physical step that you took towards the fulfillment of it. You imagine yourself having a marvelous business. And then comes the day a building is for sale and you have a nickel towards it. And a total, not a total stranger, but a man comes in and asks you quite in a friendly manner, are you going to buy it? And knowing you don't have a penny, you say to him, as you would a friend to a friend, with what? And then he says, well, I have money. It's only in the bank put, drawing nothing. You say, well, I have no collateral. But he said, I watch you. You're an honest person. Your family, they're honest. I think they are. Would you like me to buy it for you? Get my lawyer to bid for it. If they knew that I'm bidding, that I have money, they'll bid me up. And so I get it at the very lowest price by getting a lawyer who represents more than one client, and they do not know who he represents, and he'll bid for it. Are you willing to take it regardless of the price? And you say, yes, I'll take it. But I have no collateral. All I need is your signature, that you will simply pay 6% on whatever the price is, and then reduce that principal over a period of 10 years. Agreed? Yes. But then sign this, and we'll see if we can buy it. That day, you owned the building. And you didn't have one nickel when you owned the building that day. You only had your signature on a piece of paper. At the end of 10 years, you repaid the man his principal. You reduce it every year, paying him 6% on the remaining principal, and reduce the entire thing at the end of 10 years. That man dies 20 years later and leaves you 150000 in cash, tax-free, and a couple of homes and many personal belongings. In the meanwhile, you continue in that business and it multiplies and multiplies. And that year was 1922, 1924. This is now 1968. That building, I'm speaking factually, that building in 1924 is now gone. He paid only $50,000 for it. It was repaid and repaid. A bank, three years ago, bought the property, because the building was rotted, bought the property for $840,000 in cash and no capital gain. From $50,000 to $840,000. In the meanwhile, the business has expanded into all the other islands, so that today you couldn't buy them out for $15 million. All in imagination. And this goes back to the imagination that preceded this man's offer to buy the building. For the young man, seeing this building and entertaining a thought that the present owners deceived his father and through deception got him out of a partnership, a junior partnership. And he was moved not to get even, but to prove that he really had something within him and could be a success in spite of their deception. And so, every day he would see on that marquee, not their name, but his own family's name. And he would see it in his mind's eye because you could not take their name and transliterate it and make it spell this man's family's name. But he saw it, and in his mind's eye he saw that name which, if true, would imply the family owned it. He did it every day, twice a day, for two years. And then came this sudden, out of the nowhere. And the whole thing was made possible, and today they're all over the islands. And they have no partners. They've never taken in one partner, never sold one bit of stock outside of a family ownership. All by imagination. Now, I know what I'm talking about because I'm a member of that family. I'm speaking of my own family. This is not hearsay. I know it. My second brother, Victor, was the one in whose imagination this whole thing began to bloom. And he still works all by imagination. 
He knows what he wants, and then after having decided in himself, that's what I want, and that's good for the business, he then in his mind's eye, he appropriates it. And then let things happen, as told us in Scripture. The vision has its own appointed hour. It ripens, it will flower. If it be long, then wait, for it is sure, and it will not be late. Read that in the book of Habakkuk. Here is the true translation of that passage in Habakkuk. So when you know what you want, remain faithful to that assumption. And the assumption, though at the moment, is denied by your senses and denied by reason. If you persist in it, it will harden into fact. Are we not told that God calls a thing that is not seen as though it were seen and then the unseen becomes seen? He calls everything from the unseen into the sea in this simple manner. For he is the resurrecting power. So if I assume that I am, I don't have to have evidence to support it. I assume that I am. I am what? Well, I name it. And having given it a name, given it form, given it definition, remaining in it, I resurrect it. And if it takes a thousand men to aid the birth of that state, a thousand men will play their parts. And I don't have to go out and look for them. Any more than my brother had to go out and look for this man. He would not have known where to start looking for one the day of the sale. As far as he is concerned, he had done it in his mind's eye. And he allowed everything to happen. And he comes right in like a joke. He really thought it was a joke. And he said to this man, are you fooling me? He said, no. He said, well, then wait. Let me call my father. He said, lunch. He called him on the wire. He said, daddy, come on up. Leave everything and come. And then he said, now you tell my father what you told me. My father's name is Joseph. And my father said, you really mean it? He said, yes, Joe, I mean it. I'll have him bid today. You put your signature here, and your son Victor put his signature. That's all I need. And that was a lifetime friendship. So when that man died, he didn't owe my brother Victor anything. He so loved the friendship and the feeling of well, decency that he had with my brother Victor, he gave him 150,000 cash. And that was tax-free. And the homes, everything was tax-free. And that building, which he bought for $50,000, was sold three years ago to the Bank of Nova Scotia. They tore it down and built a lovely structure, but they paid our family $840,000 for that building. So here was a gain, and there was no cap capital tax gain. None. That whole thing was simply free. So I know what I'm talking about. All I need from you is the acceptance of it. Will you believe it? Will you believe that with God all things are possible? Will you believe that all things are possible to men? Well, you can prove it in the not distant future. But you are the operant power. It will not work itself. If you dare to assume this very night that you have a better job than you know how, or that you have a larger income, you may be fired tomorrow. Don't be concerned. On reflection, you'll see it was necessary to move you towards the fulfillment of your assumption. You could be fired. And I wouldn't bat an eye if you told me tomorrow, well, I did what you told me. You know what happened? I was fired. I have seen that. It takes someone to fire you, to get you into a better job. I have seen that time and again. I wouldn't go out and quit the job. You may be promoted in the job. Or you may be invited by some other concern that is competitive to join them. I do not know how it happens. I only know if you remain faithful to the assumption, it's going to happen. And you're going to be promoted towards the fulfillment of the state that you have dared to assume that is yours. I could tell you unnumbered stories along this nature. So here I say, dwell in the end. The end is where we begin. For if I see my name on the marquee, that's the end. I don't wait for the incident to take place in my world to move from one to the other to the other, leading up to that. I dwell in the end. If I go to the very end, what would it be like, were it true? A health case. Not how it's going to become better, but you go to the end. And you say to someone who isn't well. And in your mind's eye, you say to them, you know, I've never seen you look better. And have them say to you, I've never felt better. 
Well, now that's confirmation of what you are seeing. You say, I've never seen you look better. And hear them say to you, well, I have never really felt better. But you may say to me, well, I can't hear people. Oh, yes, you can. You can hear anything you want to hear. You don't have to hear it audibly. Listen this very moment. You may not be able to whistle a tune. Maybe you can carry a tune in any manner whatsoever. You can play an instrument. You can whistle. You can sing. Well, can you now imagine that you are hearing the battle hymn of the Republic? Listen, can't you hear it? Can't you augment it? A thousand voices, ten thousand voices. Did you hear it at the funeral of Senator Kennedy? Did you see it on TV? Wasn't that moving? When the organ began to peal, and suddenly that lovely soft voice singing it, and the whole thing became, well, the whole vast TV world was filled with it. I doubt there were very many dry eyes when he got through singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Well, I can sing, I, I can whistle the tune, but I can just sit right now or stand here and listen and hear the entire thing swell. If I tried to duplicate it in my, with my voice, I couldn't do it, but I can hear his voice as he sang it. You can hear anyone's voice. You can hear the speaker's voice. Tonight alone, you can hear my voice, and you can put upon my voice what you want to hear. And I, unknown to you, I will find myself telling you. Something will happen to confirm what you're hearing. So you can do this for good or ill. I advise you, do it for good. But the choice is yours. You can hurt and you can bless, but don't hurt. Use your imagination always lovingly on behalf of others. But to tell you that you couldn't do it to hurt is stupid because you can hurt. But it's entirely up to you. So you imagine what you want. Believe that you have it and see how it works in the world. Those who scoff at it or let them scoff. Five years from now, when you're on the top, they may be working for you. And they've even forgotten that they sat in the same audience with you when you heard and believed, and they also heard, but they didn't believe. And so you moved on, and they remained behind. And that's life. But there's only one creative power in the universe. Scripture names that power as God, Jesus Christ, the Lord, the same power. Because there aren't two gods, there aren't two lords, there's only one. And that one Christ dwells in us. He did not appropriate a single man, as scripture, not, I mean, the priesthoods of the world teach. They tell you of a single man, and they single out a man that differs from all men. He isn't dwelling in this man or that man. His desire was to save humanity. And so he dwells in us, not in that particular man. He didn't become this one man, uh, dwelling in one man. No, let no one tell you that the Christ in you differs from the Christ, and let them name any man they want. He cannot differ. If there is a Christ other than that Christ who is crucified within us, and who rose and continues to rise in humanity, he is a false Christ. And the teachers who teach of an external, objective, different Christ, of false teachers. Christ is within, and he rises within. And so you go out and put it to the test, put it to the extreme test. Christ in us, not out there, is the hope of glory. So this word of which I speak, and the word, by the way, its true definition is meaning. In the beginning there was meaning to the whole thing. And that meaning was with God. And God himself was the meaning. There is a purpose, there is a plan behind it all. Waken in us so that we and he are one. So he actually became us that we may become God. It seems incredible, but it's true. That's the purpose of life. To take humanity and lift it to God. So it becomes God. So he became man that man may become God. Now well, tonight, you need not confine it to yourself. Take a friend, without the friend's consent, without the friend's knowledge, and lift him up. 
Do you know of a friend who is unemployed? Well, then see him gainfully employed. And don't tell him that you may brag tomorrow. Don't boast. Just see him gainfully employed. Here's a friend of mine in L.A. And this man was unmercifully bawled out by his superiors and told that he was no earthly good and they are considering letting him go. They're going to fire him. Well, the man had no support outside of the job. And he had a family. He told my friend. Well, my friend lives by this law. So he said to him, all right, go your way. Didn't tell him what he's going to do. He sat quietly at his desk and heard the man tell him that they praised him beyond measure for something that he had done. It wasn't 48 hours that the complete reversal of their attitude towards this man in their praise of something he did in the advertising world. But the blow had left its mark. And he said to my friend, yes, they've reversed it, but I don't feel easy on the job. Because they could not have said the unlovely things that they've said and forgotten them. So it will come back, and I'm going to quit. I have no money. I'm giving them two weeks' notice. I'm going to ask them to give me one week of the two that I may get myself together, maybe take off a few days, and just get my thoughts in order. Well, at the end of two weeks, he didn't have a job. My friend, when he told him what he was going to do, my friend knew he could not afford to quit and not work. So he saw him gainfully employed and earning 25% more than the present job. He took off the second week. When he came back at the end of the first week, he came into my friend's office and said, only yesterday I got the offer and I start Monday. I do not lose one day's salary and I start at 25% more than I received on the past job. What did it? My friend's imagination. A loving use of the imagination on behalf of a friend. Had he gone without that imaginal state, he would have walked into the place and the man would have said, we have nothing. Or we can't use you. Why are you quitting? He didn't ask anything. He simply wanted the man. So if you precede your visit by an imaginal act, they will see you as you see yourself. If you walk in knowing that you're no good, they're going to see you exactly that way. But if you're walking in the assumption that things are as you desire them to be, they're going to see you that way. And this is life. Now what greater claim can anyone make than to claim that he is God? When he claimed it, they said he is blaspheming. For here is a man, and the man dares to claim he is God. The tenth of John. And he said, is it not written in your law, I say ye are gods, sons of the Most High? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, do you say of the one that he anointed and sent into the world that he is blaspheming? Do you have any greater claim in the world than for a man to identify himself with God and walk as though he were? And not be ashamed to admit it? He doesn't go bragging about it, but he knows in his heart he is one with God. Or if his imagination is God and he imagines, well then that's God. And if he imagines a state and it comes to pass, then he knows the creative power that is God. He doesn't have to brag about it and boast about it, but he doesn't have to hide it either. He doesn't have to bury it and be ashamed of it. He sleeps in a noble state because he's one with God. But let everyone take that attitude and the world will change. Not be beaten, but you can take the whole vast world if they feel themselves slaves. Give them the world, they'll want it again tomorrow. And if a man has self-respect, you can give him all the money in the world and it means nothing. That goes for the individual, it goes for a family, it goes for a race of people, it goes for a nation. This is our late President Hoover said, the rise and fall of ideas will determine the rise and fall of men, the rise and fall of nations, the rise and fall of communities. So tell me the idea the community entertains about itself, and I'll tell you that community. But now change that idea of itself and you'll change that community. Let a family feel important in itself. It doesn't have to have a background. Who has a background? So you go back far enough, and almost everyone who now claims importance would be ashamed of that background. So don't go back. Start just where you are. And don't pay anyone to look up your family tree, because you're going to pay them to forget it. Just all of a sudden, start right now, and assume the dignity that is God. That's what your real background is God. And so assume it.
and then walk in that assumption, and if you have children, I hope you do, well then, instill that into the child. Instill it into all within the environment, and have them feel important. I have no background judged by human standards, either intellectual, financial, or these things. We have made it. But Mother instilled in us, when we did something of which she was ashamed, she would say to us, have you forgotten that you are a goddard? We didn't know. That must have been very important. Because Mother said, have you forgotten that you are a goddard? Well, I never heard that we ever had any background. But all of a sudden you began to feel that you must be important. So Mother instilled it into our mind's eye. She made the name important. So today it is important where we are. In the business sense, in every sense, it's important. But Mother did that and she married a man who had no background and took his name. But she made it important. All right? Who has any background? As far as I'm concerned, I refuse to accept the aristocracy of any being in this world other than the aristocracy of the spirit. What other aristocracy? Give me the aristocracy of the spirit, but don't come to me with any physical descent. I'm not an animal. I'm not a horse. Will you develop it by one horse after the other? I'm God. We're all God. You can't go back beyond God. So if that's the start of all of us, well then that is our root. And so, claim it now. At any point in time, claim it. And you'll find yourself being washed clean of anything you might have thought the family tree held. You don't have any family tree. The true Israelite is not a descendant after the flesh, but the elect of God, of whatever nation. That's the man of God. So you simply dare to assume that you are that man of God. And then apply what I'm telling you tonight. And may I tell you, in the not distant future, in the immediate present, it'll work. If you don't falter and do not change the assumption, if you remain faithful to the assumption, it will harden into fact. Because imagining creates reality. It does. Now let us go into the silence. Now, are there any questions, please? My dear, there's a man in this state today by the name of Krishnamurti. He was a member of the Theosophical uh, Society when Annie Besant and Alcott and that entire crowd ran it. That book is still in print. They brought out a book without his consent. They tried to make him a Christ. The reincarnation of Jesus Christ. He didn't deny it. He didn't go against it. He allowed it. And that book came out. And they are literally hundreds of full page pictures of his so called reincarnations of the past. One, the male, female, male, female, Chinese, Indian, Oriental, uh, Caucasian, all these. I don't think they included the Negro. They hadn't quite integrated them in this setup. And here he went all the way back, but not into the Negro. He was some, something different. Then when he got big enough and courageous enough to deny it, he denied it. But they're printed those books, and they're still in the library, and they're still in the homes of individuals. And now he will go from the world as their part of this world, and those who will come tomorrow will not know it was refuted. And go along and believe it. I tell you, my dear, stick to the Bible. All these are simply theories, man-made theories for one purpose, to make a buck. It's cruel to say that, but I cannot let it go by. Ninety-nine percent of them are in it only for a dollar. Seems cruel, but I'm telling you what I know. I've gone through these many isms. It has nothing to do with spirituality. You are individualized, and you tend forever towards greater and greater individualization. You will never lose your identity. You will awaken one day, and you are the Lord Jesus Christ himself, without loss of identity. That's the great mystery. I will know you. And when you awaken, and you are born from above, 
and you'd behold the fatherhood of God, and you being the father, I will know you. You will not lose your identity, and yet I will know you to be God. I will know you to be Jesus if I'll know you as you are now. And it will not seem strange to you that you are Jesus. You will not bow your head in shame, and yet you will not lose your identity. I have had these uh, men and women too, who make these claims. You can induce it. You can actually induce it by an assumption. I'll give you my own personal experience of the crucifixion. And it's so unlike what the world teaches. I have experienced scripture. Scripture has been fulfilled in me. I found myself this night in the fulfillment of the 42nd Psalm. Which is, and he went with them in a throng to the house of God. He led them in a gay procession to the house of God. Well, here I am in this enormous crowd all like the Arab world. And as I'm walking with them, a voice out of the blue sings out. And the voice stated, and God walks with them. A woman at my right asked the invisible voice, and if God walks with us, where is he? And the voice answered, and all heard the voice. And the voice said, at your side. She turned to her left, looked me full in the face, and began to laugh. And she said to the voice, you mean Neville is God? And the voice answered, yes, in the act of waking. Then the voice spoke, but from within me, no one but the speaker heard it then. And the voice said within me, I laid myself down within you to sleep. And as I slept, I dreamed the dream. I dreamed, and I knew exactly what the end of that sentence would be, he is dreaming that is I. With that, I became so emotionally thrilled, I felt myself drawn into this body that I was on the bed. For well, this took place in the spirit world. I felt myself drawn into this body, and this hand was a vortex, this hand was a vortex, my head a vortex, my feet vortices, and my side, the right side a vortex. And I knew then what the crucifixion was. It was sheer ecstasy. It wasn't painful at all. You can't describe the thrill of these six forces nailing me to this body. So you're told in the 10th of John, no one takes away my life. I lay down myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to lift it up again. And in spite of that statement, they teach year after year that a group of men murdered him and nailed him to a wooden cross. He is not nailed to any wooden cross. The universal Christ is nailed on humanity. This is the cross. And he did it willingly. I lay it down myself. No one took it from me. And I experienced that that night. So you can bring all the arguments in the world about this little stigmata. That's no stigmata. There was no blood running there. The whole hand, both hands, whirling vortices. And the head of whirling vortex and the side of whirling vortex, and both feet, the soles of my feet, vortices. And they are six. Yes, sir. Judas, I am self-betrayed. No one knows me but myself. No one knows the thoughts of a man but the spirit of man who dwells in him. Likewise, no one knows the thoughts of God but the spirit of God. Therefore, if I betrayed God, I would have to be the Spirit of God, one who has the secret. And so it's self-betrayed. One night in a room about the size of this, and here I am, sitting on the floor, with twelve men before me sitting on the floor. We're all dressed in robes, and I'm teaching the Word of God. A man, one of these twelve, jumps up quickly, and the moment he jumped up, I knew exactly what he was going to do. He was going to tell the authorities what I was teaching. He went through the only door. As he went through, and I knew what would happen, a tall, handsome man, about six feet four, in most costly robes, came in, erect, a man about 40, 44. He walked straight down the side, turned at right angles, walked straight down the side, turned at right angles, and walked down the middle. But as he entered, he was one of such authority, we all rose. He was one of tremendous authority in that community.
and we all stood at attention. I facing my is eleven now. He came on down and he turned towards me, and he took a wooden mallet and a wooden peg, and he hammered it into my right shoulder, blow after blow into my shoulder. Then he took a very sharp instrument, and with one circular motion like this, he severed my sleeve, and then pulled it, and pulled off the sleeve, and discarded it. And I saw it, a lovely shade of light baby blue. Then he stretched his arms out this way, and he embraced me, and kissed me on the right side of my neck. And I kissed him on the right side of his neck. As I kissed him, still embracing him, the whole scene faded. Here is the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It's all symbolism, but the whole thing is true. That was the betrayal. For you are now nailed. The pay goes in. As you are told, I will now put upon you all the authority of Israel, and you will rule it for a season. Then I will break the peg, and that weight that you carry will be taken from you. But who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He unveils the right arm, which is the symbol of power. At that moment in time when he rises in you, and you are going to rule as he rules. And that's the story. So the whole story is true, but it's all vision. It's not secular history. It's salvation history. And the world treats the whole Bible as, sec as a secular history. And it's not secular history at all. The whole thing takes place above. He says, I am from above and you are from below. You are of this world, I am not of this world. And so the whole drama is unfolding above. It's a mystical drama. Well, freedom is that age. No one is free by dying here. Because death here is restoration in a world just like this. No one, I don't care who you are, you could be 90 years old now, and if you drop this very moment, you're restored to life, not as an infant, someone about 20 years of age. And you're not old, you're young, and any missing part, teeth, hair, limbs, all restored. Unbelievably new, and unaccountably new. You can account for it. How can someone cremated, turn to dust, and stand before me 20 years old, and when they dropped, they looked like a thousand. They were so old and withered. And here suddenly before me stands this beautiful island woman or man, 20 years old, in a world terrestrial just like this, in a body that is physical just like this, cut it, it will bleed, and they age there as they age here, and they die there as they die here. And so there's no escape from this until resurrection. And resurrection comes to the individual. It doesn't come collectively. It comes while we walk in this earth. The individual is raised and set free from this bondage to decay and becomes then one with the risen Lord. Because there's only one body, one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all. Continues to grow. Continues to grow. He is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. This world is the world of dead. People won't believe it. Everything here is dead. If you see it from above, well, you'll have to see it to understand what I'm talking about. If you see this from above, everything here is like, well, something that is dead. And you can come down, you can't change it from above, strangely enough. I've tried to change it from above. Look at the body, it's on the bed, and it looks like something like a carcass that is dead. Well, if you know exactly the wisdom is from above, if you can only do with it now, while you're there, with the clarity of vision, but you can't do it. You've got to come down and occupy it. And then you forget. This is the world of death. Yes, sir. Pardon me? Animals? I don't know this much. One night I found myself at the top of a very tall ladder. And below me, I would say the forest. The beast of the forest, like tigers, lions, Jaguars, all the wild beasts of the forest. And they were angry, and I was afraid. I stood on the very top rung, and I was really concerned for my safety. They were angry looking, and moving with all the anger of the world. Then it dawned upon me, but that's myself made visible. That is the creative power. 
enormous power in me. I arrested the activity in me, not in them, and they all stood still. They were frozen as though they were made of clay. I came down the ladder and they were dead. Their life was in me. I came upon a scene, a simple little scene, and the scene was just like a Sunday afternoon dinner. And they were dining, and the minute I saw them dining, I knew that if I could arrest the activity which I was feeling within me, that these people would go still. They'd all be still. Well, I had no sooner entertained the thought than I did. I froze my head. As I did so, here was a, a foursome, two young fellows, about 21, 23 years old, and their parents in their middle forties. And one fellow face, facing me was having soup, and he had just brought the soup uh, spoon this far. When I froze the activity in my head, he couldn't move it. The waitress coming through the door with the second course, she stopped in her tracks. Everything stopped. A bird flying flew not. The grass waving waved not. Leaves falling fell not. Everything froze. And when I released the activity in me, all things continued in their course. The bird that was, a fro that was frozen and arrested continued. Now, if I froze that bird right now, and he's in flight, would he not fall? If a bird is now still, it can't remain in the air and be still. It has to be in motion to remain in the air. Well, it was not in motion and it didn't fall. Everything froze and the leaves could not fall. And the waitress walking with that second course couldn't walk. And the boy, young fellow, 21, 22, he couldn't continue the action. And when I released that activity in my head, then he continued the action and took the soup. And she continued to bring the thing. And I saw that when I woke from that state, everything changed in my world. That everything here is dead. And we are the animating power. Without man, everything will be dead. Nature will be dead. For God is in man. And were it not that that living word is in man, everything here would be dead. And you take that power to rest it, and everything here stands still. For the world is yourself pushed out. Well, the time is up until the next.